So first, we definitely want to start by thanking Nancy and Darsha for bringing us together um, and uh, giving us the opportunity to work on this project together, which is just, we found it very productive and it wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have worked together on it if we hadn't had this reason to do so. And it's just been much better than it would have been otherwise. Um, so we are, just to refresh your memory, construct, constructing, conducting a hybrid sociological philosophical study of the conservative Protestant movement to open dialogue with lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender or LGBT people uh, to, uh, in some cases, to affirm LGBT and similar identities, same-sex marriage, and alternative gender expressions. Um, yeah, I'll get to that in a second, actually. Okay, so we're using the methods of participant observation, document analysis, and semi-structured interviews with participants in these four overlapping organizations. Uh, and so the top two are um, national and somewhat international in scope. The bottom two are more local organizations, but there are people who participate in all of these organizations and you know go, go to different conferences and everything. It's, it's an overlapping kind of network of people all working in different ways towards similar goals. Um, so the movement that we're talking about um, is dealing, I wanna give you some t terminology just so that you know what we're talking about here. So they're working to make the church more open to lesbian and gay, presumably you know what those categories mean. Bisexual, meaning potentially attracted to people uh, regardless of the other's sex or gender. Transgender people or trans people, meaning people who feel that they're of a different sex than what they were assigned at birth. Um, Cisgender, we're gonna use that term a lot. Uh, that means people who feel themselves to be of the sex category they were assigned to at birth. So if you're not transgender, you might well be cisgender. Um, and this movement, so this movement deals with um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, sometimes intersex people who are people who were born with bodies, there's 42 different conditions that uh, mean that they're not easily categorized as male or female. Um, it also sometimes talks about queers and involves queer people. Um, we're, we aren't really talking about queers, mostly because queer people are often also LGBT, something in there, um, or possibly also intersex, uh, and because the term has so many different meanings, it's just, uh, we're, it's just too fraught to, to deal with for right now. Um, it also includes sometimes people who identify as asexual, uh, and people who sometimes, uh, sometimes people who identify as Native American two-spirit people. Uh, and so sometimes it's abbreviated LGBTQIA2S plus uh, to indicate that they're talking about anyone who challenges uh, complementarian or binary, binary ideologies of gender and sexuality just by existing. All right. So this is just an abbreviation for all these categories. They're often invoked together, but and it's often invoked like LGBT, like of course that's what we're talking about. Um, but we're, people, people often forget what those, word, those letters are supposed to stand for, and so uh, we don't always use the same string of letters because we're not actually always talking about all of those categories of people. All right, so uh, in light of the conversation of um, Blaine and Brad's paper earlier, I just want to make clear, so we're talking about a specific situation, a specific context of people, um, and so we're talking about Christian conceptions of virtue, and we know that not everybody is interested in Christian conceptions of virtue. Um, hopefully, there's you know some some you know the, the dynamics here will shed light on other conceptions of virtue too. So please just ride this train for a while. Um, we're talking about conservative Christians, mostly in the U.S., but also Canada, the U.K., Australia, um, who express similar commitments to what counts as virtue, and this is people within this movement and the people that they're trying to challenge and change. Um, there's variation within this group and beyond in terms of how rationalist or charismatic they are. There's different sorts of uh, theologies based on uh, you know, different racial groups and things like that. But you know, they're generally committed to, the similar, to similar notions of virtue, similar tenets of Christianity, including um, you know, following the practice and teachings of Jesus, um, and adhering to a certain uh, a closeness to scripture. Uh, they distinguish themselves from liberal Christians in that way. Um, so we've been conceptualizing a particularly pervasive kind of spiritual violence that's, that we've seen directed at LGBT Christians, and we call it sacramental shame, which um, 
in which people demand that they constantly display shame as a sign that they've not turned their backs on God. We've been investigating how the self is harmed by this sacramental shame, as well as how perpetrators and victims can both overcome these institutional abuses and acquire the motivation to cultivate such virtues. See all of that? See how it's all in there? Um, such as uh, virtues of compassion, humility, and Christian love that can serve as counterforces to this form of spiritual violence. So we began our collaboration with three central research questions. Question one was how does sacramental shame erect barriers to virtue development for both its victims and those who actively dispense it? Question two was what enables LGBT church members to overcome the spiritual violence of sacramental shame, to experience God as loving rather than hostile, and to be able to engage in compassionate service to others? And question three, was what motivates non-LGBT Christians to stop this sacramental shaming and to move toward authentic Christian love. Now the project has actually developed into three main themes. We're focusing on shame, gender, and justice, uh, but we'll spend most of our time today focusing our thoughts on um, shame and virtue since that's what we've been working on for our contribution to the special issue. So first, we're briefly gonna um, well, no, we're not, okay. So we've been conducting interviews and participant observation and attending field work events together has actually enriched the observations and the theorization that we've been working on. Um, we predicted that we would have approximately 100 interviews completed by May 31st. We have 85, along with about 450 combined hours of participant observation. For the most part, we've begun to hear the same themes from people, so we know that we're about done with interviews with white, gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals, as well as heterosexual cisgender, uh, again, you know, not transgender, um, allies. So now we're focusing on collecting additional interviews with particular groups that we need to hear more from, which includes people of color and side B celibate uh, lesbians and gay men. And we'll, and possibly if we can find a few more willing participants, a few more trans people. But because of the racist dynamics of sexual shame just in America in general, uh, and actually I think you could say in the world, right? Um, we hired a consultant who's black and queer to conduct some interviews and focus groups, and she's been proceeding with that more slowly than projected, but she's getting really great interview material for us. So we're gonna attend hopefully two more national conferences, just because each one is so different, um, but we're done with our bi-weekly observations. So, Today, we wanna to talk about one part of our research that's exploring whether and how feeling shame can motivate people to virtue. Now, shame is not in itself a moral virtue, but some philosophers have argued that feeling ashamed for one's moral flaws can motivate people to become more virtuous and to restore damaged relationships. However, the empirical literature from psychology and sociology suggests that shame often yields psychologically unhealthy responses for those who feel it, including rage or depression, and often seems to motivate morally worse action than whatever occasioned the initial shame experience, including aggression and violence. Excuse me one moment. So one reason for the gap between philosophical ideals and empirical realities is that many philosophical debates over the moral value of shame have largely ignored how shame operates through social power. Our study calls attention to the motivational aspects of shame, pride, and humility within relations of social power. So today we're gonna compare the shame experiences of LGBT conservative Christians and the heterosexual cisgender Christians who once shamed them but are now allies. These divergent shame experiences lead us to argue that a person's liability to both virtuous pride and virtuous humility, realistic assessments of their basic worth and value and their gifts as well as their flaws, affects the extent to which they're liable to experience shame as a catalyst for moral improvement and restoring damaged relationships. So we draw from a number of other scholars who've defined shame as fear that a perceived flaw in the self will cause a break in the social bond. And that includes, you know, we wanna be more specific actually about what that social bond is, so we're including both a sense of belonging in the community, but also the more specific sense of um, Martin Buber's concept of an I-thou relationship. So Buber distinguishes between an intimate, 
ego-free, I vow relationship um, from a more superficial, ego-driven, I, it experience. Relationship, in Buber's sense, is not just any routine interaction, but a feeling of boundless connection and profound equality in which the self is open to being touched, in his words, at the core by the other, to growing and changing as a result of the connection between them. Such growth cannot be a conscious goal because, as Buber points out, any purpose, any means and calculation is an obstacle to relationship. We'll argue that some forms of shame reflect a disruption in interpersonal connection at this level. So our study also leads us to affirm Dennis Whitcomb and colleagues in linking humility and pride as two sides of a single virtuous disposition. However, unlike most philosophical definitions of these emotions, including theirs, we find that both humility and proper pride are not merely emotions of self-assessment, but are grounded in concern to protect relationship. We call this single disposition humility pride to foreground that it enables a virtuous, realistic appraisal of both one's strengths and one's limitations, rooted in concern to protect relationship. We argue that humility pride is the basis for virtuous shame experiences. So a little more about shame. There's no single agreed upon definition of shame, but drawing from philosophers, psychologists, and sociologists, we define it as an inwardly directed emotion with three central aspects. Painful exposure as a defective self, a fear of a break in the social bond, as we've discussed, who will, um, who will leave or you know, break the bond because of that flaw, and a sense of powerlessness over one's identity, which is constituted by internalizing the perceptions of significant others. So we have a social conception of what it means to be a human being. Theorists often initially define shame by distinguishing it from guilt, which is action-oriented and more readily fixable. I did this thing, I'm sorry, can, how can I make it better? By contrast, shame is person-based and says, I am bad in all or some respects. But the pain of shame is not just the pain of realizing that one is flawed. It is the pain of feeling exposed as flawed in ways that can make important others question one's worthiness for relationship and belonging. So shame is ambivalent. It reflects a desire to hide, turn away, and withdraw, and a longing to be recognized, accepted, and loved. As Eve Sedgwick put it, blazons of shame, the fallen face with eyes downward and head averted, are semaphores of trouble, and at the same time, of a desire to reconstitute the interpersonal bridge. Religious historian Virginia Burris writes that shame is the affect that checks narcissism and monitors interpersonal relatedness and communal commitments. Shame is supposed to protect the social bond, but the affect of shame is awful. In their phenomenological psychological study of shame and guilt experiences, Gunnarsson and, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce Gunnarsson's colleague's Swedish-looking name, um, Soberg, is that name? Um, no one knows? Oh, I should have just wung it then, huh? Uh, report that their re respondents describe shame as being stuck in a frozen now, unable to focus or be present to what's happening around them, having racing or obsessive thoughts, and feeling desperate to hide away or even to disappear into the ground. In this light, it's not surprising that people often refuse to acknowledge their shame. Psychologist Michael Lewis reports that bypass shame is common, and the two most common emotional substitutions are anger, which often becomes rage, and sadness that often turns into debilitating depression. Shame can be experienced in different ways. It may be totalizing, here's where we get to the real high-tech part, um, in that a person feels like their whole self is defective, or a person may feel ashamed only of some aspect of the self. Even when a person is in the grip of feeling this partial sort of shame, the flawed aspect can feel totalizing of who they are and make them feel temporarily powerless over their identity, frozen in the shame gaze and unable to act. Shame experiences also vary in their temporal dimensions. People can experience shame either in isolated episodes that come on suddenly or in a chronic state of being. A person is liable to feel shame episodically when a loss of rank or status in the eyes of others is not generally expected, and so the shame is felt as a sudden exposure that lowers one's standing. By contrast, when shame is chronic, the elements of painful exposure, fear of rejection and powerlessness are all present, but rather than being experienced as sudden, unexpected intrusions into an otherwise undisturbed consciousness, shame can get instilled as a disposition and become the way a person feels emotionally at home in the world. 
for those with a disposition of shame, acute shame feelings just confirm that sense that they were unworthy all along. Our data show that while episodic shame may have moral benefits under certain conditions, when shame becomes a person's habitual way of navigating the world, it does tremendous violence to the self and, we argue, erects enormous obstacles to virtue development. The situations that we're talking about can both be totalizing and chronic. So we might depict it like this in our fancy diagramming technology, but so in that lower, uh, lower left quadrant there, but if you're living there, it feels like this, in the, the big purple dot of shame. Right? Now, many people in these faith communities believe that God's plan for creation includes two complementary sexes and that this complementarity is not just a general description, but a commandment, unspoken because it's so obvious, preceding the Ten Commandments in time and importance. Conventional conservative Protestants hold and generate what Pierre Bourdieu called symbolic power by repeating this interpretation of scripture and positing same-sex attraction and variant experiences of gender to be sinful violations of it that separate a person from God in the community or even indicate a rebellion against God. They often repeat statements like homosexuals have a rebellious spirit or homosexuals have turned their backs on God. Heterosexual cisgender conservative Christians tend to assume that LGBT people should feel shame in order to start on the path to change because they believe that LGBT identities and the practices that they associate with them, rightly or wrongly, are sinful. And they know from experience that shame for their sins, acts or thought that, thoughts that violate their relationships with God or other people, cause them to atone and to become better people. But shame does not help fix sexual orientation and gender variance the way it works for sins like theft or lying. Rather than helping to restore relationships, shame in these cases targets people's very capacity to form relationships. Because minority sexual orientations and experiences of gender are wholly unaffected by acts of will and do not do harm the way that sins do, Shame in these cases becomes perpetual, but something like a sacrament, a tangible sign to others that they desire God's presence in their lives and have not, in fact, rebelled against God. So sacramental shame takes the fear of a break in relationship and perversely makes that fear a requirement for relationship. It attacks the capacity to relate. It is often dispensed through affection and care, we talked last year about um, those parents, the Robertsons, whose child had become a, um, an addict after six years of trying, them constantly trying to fix him. Um, and then it says that that's, that's the way God made it, to, you know, made it all to be. This is what God wants for your life. So the, the relative Im immutability of sexual orientation or gender variance thus makes shame not an episodic disruption, but a chronic condition that perpetually disrupts a person's ability to realistically address or assess their strengths and weaknesses and to love and serve others. In fact, many of these churches do not allow LGBT people, even those committed to celibacy, to serve the church as fully as people they believe to be heterosexual and cisgender. They constantly remind the former that their capacities to love and know God and themselves are broken and in fact a danger to the people they care about. Now many in this movement see shame's effects as toxic, poisoning not just relationships, but individuals' mental and even physical health. Some speak of depression and attempts at suicide, and others speak of surprising physical consequences, including a young black woman in her 20s being hospitalized with uncontrollable asthma attacks, a healthy mixed-race woman in her early 20s being hospitalized with a heart rate of 19, and a former Nashville Christian music superstar contracting a rare and life-threatening autoimmune disorder, all of which could only be traced by their doctors to stress caused by shame around gender and sexuality um, and the fear of losing their place in the church. Our data, um, our data suggest that uh, what's toxic is not just the mixed messages of I love you but I hate the way you love others or whatever, but the fact that church members sometimes unintentionally break relationship with an LGBT person and then posit that rupture as that person's fault, but then there's nothing that person can do to fix it. LGBT respondents say things like I lost about 80% of my friends when I stopped being celibate or I was thrown out of my home when I came out to my parents and even allies lose relationships. 
as we discussed last year, even well-intentioned efforts to fix a person break relationship because, as Buber says, any means or purpose impedes relationship. As one of our respondents blogged, love listens, but many in these churches close themselves off from listening to or learning from LGBT people, lest they have to replace their narratives about gender and sexuality and its place in creation. For LGBT people who've internalized these conservative teachings and who spend years trying to rid themselves of their attractions or suppress their experience of gender, the absence of change creates the feeling that no matter how desperately they love God, God must, love, but must not love them, and in fact, that God's rejection of them is their fault. For many of these respondents, shame is instilled as a disposition. So in, in a blog and in person, Kevin Garcia has eloquently described how chronic, sacramentalized shame about his same-sex attractions nearly killed him, both spiritually and literally. He says, These unwanted homosexual attractions were something I viewed as a cancer to be cured, a tumor on my heart to be cut out. I was terrified to share my torment with many people because I was ashamed. I was told that if I just prayed the right prayers, if I fasted, if I did the heart work, that maybe, hopefully, God would grant me the grace to overcome these temptations, but nothing ever worked. Not therapy, not prayer, not getting demons cast out of me, not fasting, not group confessions, not holy oil, nothing. For 10 years, I was convinced it was something wrong with me. It had to be me. I wasn't ever going to be good enough for God because I wasn't strong enough to overcome this trial. What was the fruit of that labor? Literal death. I wanted to kill myself and nearly did. I tried to kill myself because I saw my heart is incontrovertibly damaged. I believed my soul was marred beyond any hope of healing. LGBT respondent after respondent recounts this kind of experience of constant and seemingly unending shame and coming to believe that their capacity for relationship was so dangerous that they could not indulge it even in friendships, leading to lives cut off from intimacy and bonding of any kind. A 25-year-old mixed-race respondent we call Emily spoke of having realized she had same-sex attractions right around the same time in high school that she became Christian. Having appreciated the redemptive possibility of the ex-gay movement at the time, the Christian movement that um, originally promised to help people get rid of their uh, homosexuality, but by the time she was in it, they just said, you know, focus on celibacy, put your identity in God. Um, she appreciated that, right? But she ascribed to what they considered her brokenness as being a gift to your community, a service to other people in your life who have kids, and you can kind of uniquely fit this niche of a helper, a social helper. She continued, because to me, to hate this part of myself so much that I spent 80% of my energy every single day attempting to eradicate it, it felt holy. It felt like that was what was making me righteous. And even though I really believed all of the Christian messages that, I'd been, that had been imparted to me about faith coming to us in the form of a gift, I can specifically remember instances of crying out to God, even if you don't take this away from me, this suffering is more than okay, because I believe you love me that much. I would do anything for this cause. And if the difficulty of my life testifies to the extent of which your love has covered the brokenness of all of humanity, then I will do this for the rest of my life. And unfortunately... That's sort of masochistic, and over time, I think, really begins to impact the way a person doesn't just relate to themselves, but relates to their friends, relates to their family members, and even relates to God. And I found myself unconsciously shutting down connection. I am an extrovert. I do love people, and I can listen to stories and laugh and have a good time. And so it was bizarre to my friends that inside I was crumbling in every moment because I was so fervently policing myself and making sure that I did not let myself go too far emotionally with someone lest I start to have this idea that I would want to share life with them and experience intimacy at any level with them. In the grip of chronic shame, Emily lost a sense of her own status as a subject, as someone capable and worthy of I vow connection with others, with anyone. All right, now Teresa will take the rest. Hi, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, okay, so that was um, some of our, our data from our LGBT respondents. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, 
how this intersects with some of the philosophical literature on shame as a possible motivation to, to virtue. Um, and I'm new to this, so this is gonna be interesting. Okay, it's the red dot, yeah? Did I push one? No, what do I push? The arrow, the arrow. right, that would make sense. Okay. Um, so many LGBT conservative church members that we've talked to experience dispositional shame that they, um, and so many that we haven't talked to, <laughs> that the Gay Christian Network holds breakout sessions on shame resilience. And I attended one as a participant observer. And in the course of small group conversation, I asked people whether they thought there could be such a thing as healthy shame, uh, whether it might ever be appropriate in the face of serious wrongdoing, for example, to feel ashamed for that. And the question was met with a unanimous and resounding no. <laughs> um, and really repeatedly, no, no, no. People had been so harmed by shame that they really saw no value in it. Um, guilt, they said, yeah, guilt maybe, but not shame. Given how awful shame feels and the extent to which shame makes a person feel reduced to the shameful thing or feel wholly flawed and steals a, away a sense of their agency, we're asking when, if ever, it can be morally good to feel shame. Several philosophers, ancient and contemporary, argue that feeling shame can motivate people to virtue or at least curb tendencies toward vice. Owen Flanagan examines the addict's shame as an appropriate moral response to the normative failures of addiction. Alexis Shotwell discusses white shame's potential to motivate anti-racist action. And Jennifer Mannion argues that shame is a better candidate than guilt for inducing positive moral transformation for two reasons both because shame targets a flawed self and not just a person's actions, and because shame comes on suddenly and unexpectedly, halting agency and jolting the individual into self-doubt about her presumed standing as a good person. Um, but like many philosophers who defend moral shame, Mannion here is speaking in general terms about its moral potential, but her analysis actually only describes one kind of shame experience, um, episodic shame that is felt about parts of the moral self by people who already feel worthy and whose moral standing in the community is not routinely threatened. So this situation may indeed serve as a moral wake-up call where people confront the moral standards they endorse and see how the moral self they are fails to live up to those standards. But as we've learned from our LGBT respondents and the empirical data we've read on, on shame, as that attests, um, very often shame leads to morally worse action, to self-harm, and sometimes even to self-destruction. So this has led some philosophers to defend moral shame more cautiously and more indirectly by considering what's wrong with shamelessness. The shameless person is invulnerable to the shaming criticisms of others. And in a 2015 article, Krista Thomason takes this approach. And she argues, she writes, quote, being shameless um, is bad because it signals a person's failure to recognize that their own point of view is not the only point of view that matters in determining their identity and how well they are doing, morally speaking. So Thomason in this article does something interesting. She argues, recognizing that shame can be really, really bad, she argues and defends um, a liability to feel shame. And she thinks a liability to feel shame is really central to morality because it's connected to humility. And in particular to the recognition that other people's perspectives of who we are matter to us. Um, and so she, she makes this comparison to the liability to grief. And she says, look, people respond to grief in all kinds of destructive ways, but the liability to feel grief, in fact, says something important about our ability to open ourselves to love and experience the pain of deep loss. And so she's doing something similar with the liability to shame. Now, Thomason doesn't define humility, and we're still developing our understanding of it. We're following those who situate humility as a mean between vicious pride and the vices of deficiency. Thank you, Nancy, for that term including self-abasement, self-abnegation, and servility. However, we want to emphasize that humility is grounded in a desire to preserve relationship. Humility enables realistic appraisal of our limitations and acceptance of our vulnerability to others, and we think it motivates us to prioritize relationship. Thomason notices how shamelessness blocks humility and in doing so impedes moral growth and relationship because humility opens us to information from other people about moral limitations that we might not see in ourselves. And so to the extent that we grant other people that kind of authority over ourselves, we make space to acknowledge that we might be wrong about our identity and our standing, that we might not be the person we think we are um, or want to be. And we recognize and acknowledge that we're not the sole determiners of our moral identity. Our LGBT respondents' shame experiences show, however, that shamelessness is not the only vicious alternative to morally good shame that's rooted in humility. 
Shame can go awry in the other direction, especially for people with stigmatized identities who are actively enjoined by others to cultivate it as a disposition because of false narratives. In this case, narratives like you have a rebellious spirit, you're addicted to sex with strangers. People who have shame as a disposition are the opposite of shameless. Their excessive vulnerability to other people's shaming criticisms and judgments that they are inferior easily turns the raw materials of humility into self-abasement, excessively belittling oneself and thinking that one is of little or no worth, and self-abnegation, self-denial that allows other people's narratives total or near total control over one's self-concept and self-estimation. So our LGBT participants teach us that the liability to feel shame does not itself indicate a presence of humility, Rather, we're proposing that the way a person is liable to feel shame influences whether they develop humility, which in turn directs shame's role in moral motivation. As Bob Roberts argues, humility is fundamental to the Christian life. It yields an even-handed, deep self-confidence that frees the self for relationship with God and neighbor, and which is necessary for the cultivation of several important Christian virtues, including joy in the Lord, gratitude, compassion, and proper contrition. Dispositional shame in our respondents impedes Christian virtue by destroying humility and making people feel chronically unworthy not only of relationship, through which many of the virtues are practiced and learned, but it seems even unworthy of virtue itself, unworthy of being a good person who loves God and serves others, precisely because trusted loved ones and moral guides have relentlessly impugned their capacity for moral goodness and often bar them from serving others. So in this last section, we want to switch gears and say that even in cases um, of episodic shame experienced by relatively privileged people, um, philosophers haven't yet really explained why shame would motivate, even those people, <laughs> why shame would motivate a person to moral improvement rather than to respond with hostile defensiveness, rationalization, or scapegoating, right? It feels awful, you want to say, like, why would I respond positively instead of saying, that's not me? Um, what is it about shame or about conditions under which shame is experienced that sometimes induce people to moral improvement? And so turning to our heterosexual cisgender allies is helping us begin to answer that question. So this section is about humility and shame and the motivation to love for those who have become allies. Some heterosexual cisgender conservative Christians are changing their minds, learning about and from LGBT and intersex people, apologizing, joining the movement, and treating LGBTI church members in a way that feels like love to everybody involved. Some come to feel ashamed of their prior treatment of LGBTI people and become motivated to achieve more authentic expressions of Christian love for them. And we want to emphasize that this motivation to love is not limited to those who hold a particular position on same-sex marriage. People have a variety of perspectives on that, but what they all share in this category is their rejection of their church's treatment of LGBT people as a special class of sinners, second-class church members whom one should keep at arm's length until they have overcome their sinfulness. And one theme that seems to dominate these responses is that in their minds and that their minds and hearts have changed because they desired to protect relationship. And we're hypothesizing that humility is really supporting that desire and setting the stage for experiencing shame as a catalyst for moral improvement. So now to some of our respondents. Um, some respondents explicitly attribute their change of heart to their concern for relationship. One respondent, an Arab-American megachurch pastor we call Edward, explained that it was his relationship with a gay friend that exposed his blind spots about gay people's experiences in the church and made him realize that it, that relationship is key to learning how to love as Jesus modeled and commanded. And he shared this. It was a complete blind spot until I was in a friend relationship with a gay person. You're dealing with people. You need to engage in conversations with them. You need to sit across from a gay or lesbian friend of yours who can say, this is really hurtful. You saying that my relationship is like incest is really hurtful. You saying it's like bestiality really dehumanizes my partner. He continues, but you need to be able to have that conversation with someone you're not going to dismiss as left wing, you know, crazy LGBT activist type. <laughs> if you don't allow yourself to be in relationship, it's very easy. And that's where I think a lot of folks in the church misstep. Edward had a close friend who led the music in his church and who was terrified to come out to him in tears for fear that he would sever their friendship and fire her. And he recalled this, that just wrecked me. It was over from there. When one of your best friends who is like, like as close to the inner circle, whatever that means, as you can be, is still afraid of you, I just, we couldn't go on another day with that, you know? 
A relationship is broken if one party fears that they cannot be fully who they are, that the other party would walk away if they knew. This pastor's friendship mattered to him, and when he realized that his friend was afraid of him, he was motivated to question his self-concept as a good friend and a loving Christian, which led him to change his church's policies. Similarly, when the eventual founder of the Reformation Project, Matthew Vines, first told his father, Monty, that he was gay and wanted to know if he could pursue a same-sex relationship and still be Christian, Monty's desire to preserve their relationship made him not want to be the one to, who denied his son that path. So describing his approach a few years later on a panel of parents at, of LGBT people at a Reformation Project conference, we think he clearly showed this connection between humility and desire to preserve relationship. And this is what he said on that panel. I had so much of myself, I had invested so much of myself into creating a good relationship with Matthew. And I was hoping to enjoy this good relationship for the rest of my life. And I was afraid that if I failed to affirm him in his desire for a same-sex relationship and a same-sex life, that could undermine our relationship. He continues, I needed to be able to speak from a position of authority, meaning that I knew what I was talking about, and I knew I really didn't. Not that I had any question that my position was right. Of course it was right. So I committed to Matthew... So I committed to Matthew that I would undertake a Bible study with him, and in part I did that because I didn't want to be the one telling him that this, was, this choice he was making was wrong. And I thought if we studied the Bible together, he would see in God's own words that this is not what God approves of, and he was going to have to deal with that himself. And to my great surprise, I found myself changing my understanding about this as we went through the Bible passages. Monty remarked that prior to this event, that he had found the whole question distasteful. His interpretation was now shaped um, not by disgust, but by a relationship of respect and love that he, di that he didn't want ruined. And again and again, straight cisgender people are coming to this movement from a place of humility. Maybe I don't really know what I'm talking about. That is evoked by their desire to preserve relationship with LGBT and intersex people, with ministry members, children, siblings, hiking buddies, neighbors. A desire to preserve those relationships seems to cultivate the vulnerability necessary to learn from another, even about deeply held and communally enforced truths regarding God's order and their own privileged place in it. We think humility sets the stage for a person to direct shame at parts of the self that are flawed and have undermined relationship, and to respond to that shame in a morally virtuous way. Not wanting any longer to identify with the self who is unloving and unchristian, but instead with the self who, often, who loves authentically as Jesus modeled and commanded. Edward, that mega church pastor we, we mentioned before, shared this. Our approach, specifically with the LGBT community, is just not working. Our theology and our reality aren't matching, yet we're trying so hard on a broad scale in the Christian community to change our reality as opposed to re-examining our theology. And that's just not working. It's hurting people. It's creating a lot of damage. This stance of even just considering that one might be wrong, being willing to listen to other people's perspectives and allow what they share to affect you, we think issues from a humble disposition. But the difference between this group of respondents, right, and our LGBT respondents is that these respondents haven't been chronically shamed, at least in this area, and they're not generally vulnerable in this context to those vices of deficiency, to self-abasement and self-abnegation that collapse the self into another's degrading narrative. So we're proposing that our data affirm this link that some philosophers are making between feeling shame and humility, but also show that feeling shame does not itself indicate humility, because different social positioning within social hierarchies makes people experience that liability to feel shame in different ways. Um, and we were going to conclude with this um, other hypothesis that's emerging from this data, but am I out of time? Do I have time to mention it? More or less out of time. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I guess I'll just say this. We think shame can be a powerful moral motivator, but only when people are emotionally able to embrace vulnerability to others and experience that exposure of their flaws without losing sight of their own worthiness. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Uh, and we can talk about the rest if, if time permits. Thank you. I'm wondering if you asked any questions that might want to explore other links between ability to have, for lack of a better word, productive shame 
and pre or meta ethical commitments or theological commitments. So, for example, does your the theology or meta ethical commitments you have about human nature, ability to change human nature, ability or sort of predestination theologies in the sense of sort of uh, whether those background factors, if you asked about people's respondents, uh, the respondents' positions on those to see if there are connections between that and, and the role of shame. Do you want to? Well, I mean, we, it, it, it's in our data set, though. I mean, there, can, am, am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, we, we have talked to people who, you know, from a, a variety of different church backgrounds, right? So, um, you know, there are people from a more Calvinist or neo-Calvinist background, as well as people from, uh, you know, more charismatic backgrounds, more like Baptist, you know. And so, you know, the people from a more Calvinist background might have more of a sense of, like, you're doomed, that's it, right? I mean, Fred Phelps comes from that kind of background. He's a neo-Calvinist bent that's just like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing you a favor here by letting you know God hates you, you know? Like, this is, I'm helping. Um, whereas, but, but, you know, the Vines family is Presbyterian, right? I mean, they're coming from a Calvinist tradition. Um, and they're, you know, the, the, there's this wide range um, in terms of, of all of that, in terms of theologies, in terms of, um, you know, whether they focus more on, you know, like, you know, the, on, you know, scrutinizing the text as closely as possible, or, you know, like, you know, experiencing the Holy Spirit. Um, and there's not, like, you know, it's interesting, you might think that um, the more charismatic, Holy Spirit-oriented people would um, be more invested in, uh, like, you can change, God can change you. But, you know, Kevin Garcia comes from that tradition, right? He tried. You know, he, he invested 10 years in that, and it didn't work. And there are lots of people in this movement who come from that tradition and are like, yeah, it's just not working. Like, the Holy Spirit does not have a problem with your orientation. It's the church that has that problem. And so, like, they, they understand that the Holy Spirit can, like, work to transform your soul in a, in a bazillion different ways. But this isn't one of those ways. Does that help or? Uh, I just wondered if it's worse when it's closed and in the data and in the subcategories or how that works. I mean, we're not we're not doing a survey, right? So we're not you know we're not like pinning people down to this, that, and the other thing and these different elements of meta ethical commitments and whatever. So like we can't you know make this claim that you know there's this like you know point four two correlation or anything, but. You know, looking at it ethnographically, it's quite clear that there are many people with all sorts of, of theological dispositions and understandings of the nature of humanity and the Holy Spirit and God and what it means to be Christian who have all come to this movement because the, the church's prior, you know, approach isn't working. And, you know, and I think that, you know, it's, you know, as many differences as there are, you know, part of what's interesting about this is that as many differences as there are among conservative Christians, there's, um, you know, this, the, the understanding of sexuality is very much American, you know? Like, they tend to have the similar, you know, narrative of where this came from and what it's about. Um, you know, and for some of them, it's, you know, possession by a demon, and for others, it's a, you know, like a, a, rebe a conscious rebellion, or whatever. But they, you know, like, they're, they're getting their knowledge from mass media, you know, and so they, ha and, they're, and from each other, you know, and so in a lot of ways, there's a, um, there are common approaches, like a lot of different churches sent people to the ex-gay movement, which is one, one, move, one or set of organizations, you know, that um, they all came to it from different angles because, you know, their theologies about sexuality are not all that distinct when it comes to questions like this, I think. Michael. Yeah, thanks. This is really important work, it seems. I, I know on my own campuses, this is a, an area that divides uh, um, the, the people who self-identify as Christians. So thank you for this work. And I'm wondering, um, I guess I have two questions. Uh, one. You said at one point that a key uh, group that you were working with rejected completely that shame could ever be viewed as a kind of uh, 
aspect for transformation, for positive transformation, for authentic integration of the self. Did I misunderstand that? Um, I'm sorry, can you, I'm not sure what part you're referring to, so could you elaborate? You, the shame, the, the GCM, the shame, like exactly. can shame oh, ever yeah, be yeah, helpful? Yeah, no that, way. Right, yes, that right the no way response. Yeah, in that group, in that setting, it was just informal conversation as part of participant observation, and I was just sort of, So yeah. why would you, one question is, yeah. why would you persist in wanting to continue with shame as yeah. such? <laughs> That's yeah. my one question. Yeah. The other question is, yeah. what, what is, and I, I really appreciate the notion of humility as preserving the, the social bond or the, mm -hmm. or, the, or the relationship, but that can also have a, hmm, you know, if it's really all in the, in, uh, for the sake of preserving certain relationships, that can be destructive. Yes. So what about the notion of guilt that someone mm -hmm. has transgressed. Where does guilt come yeah. in? Why isn't that Thank a better you. construct than shame? Yeah, it's a great question. And in fact, la um, last year after the conference when we were doing more reading on shame and starting to do more field work together, we actually confronted that very question and wondered ourselves, like, maybe this is just a terrible emotion that is we have to endure and that we should strive to, you know, kind of steel ourselves against and resolve, but there's no good in it at all. Um, <clears throat> but um, we're, we were finding both in parts of the literature and in our respondents that that wasn't, that wasn't a, a unilateral view and that especially this idea that, that the, the, the fact that shame um, targets the self, it may have more traction than guilt at deeper kind of self change if it can be resolved and confronted in a healthy way. And a lot of these shame theorists we've been reading from a variety of disciplines are, are talking about that ambivalence of shame, that on the one hand, it does reflect um, this, this terrible sense of like turning away, withdrawing from relationship, you know, wanting to disappear into the ground, but that it also reflects a longing and yearning for connection and that that's, so it's got this ambivalent feature um, that it's, it's, it's there for a reason, as a kind of you know, emotional red flag, that maybe there's something deeply about something that in me, not just something I've done, that's really threatening to relationships I care about. Um, and so in our, in our allies, for example, we, we began to see that like, that's, we thought that's sort of what was going on. Like the Robertsons, for example, at the very end of their testimony, which we shared last year, they actually say, we didn't want to just do better. We wanted to become better people. We wanted to become better Christians, more loving parents. We realized that Ryan showed us that we didn't just, you know, um, act poorly, that we in fact were not loving parents. That was their own words. We were abusive and we didn't even realize it. We were not faithful Christians and we didn't even realize it. So it's about shame's ability, I think, to really touch at you know, character, the self, something more than just transgression that's let us kind of hold on to that and, and want to work with it, both in the literature and in the data. So that's, and what was the second one? Oh, humility, yeah, humility can definitely, so we, we're thinking of it, positioning it as a virtue, and we're still trying to work this out, but in, a, in that virtuous mean between, you know, self-abnegation and self-denial, really having um, this kind of um, proper vulnerability, not collapsing the self into sort of anyone's degraded narrative. And the part we didn't get to share that we're beginning to hypothesize and try to develop is this idea that humility and pride are actually, proper pride, are two sides of this single disposition that enables a kind of um, um, healthy sense of self-worth that protects from de degrading treatment, but also vulnerability and openness to the other. So we're, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. this is yeah. our, our yeah. high tech. That's where we're going. Yeah, this yeah. is where we're going, but it's super, um, I mean, first of all, it's super crude in its depiction, but it's also new. We're sort of, this is what we're trying to think through. And we've benefited so much from Bob Roberts' <laughs> uh, articulation of the vices of self importance as being the way of unifying all those vices of pride and, and thinking of, um, we think we're talking about arrogance, but we might be talking about more vices of pride as well, but that they share some of these features. But this, this virtuous disposition, we're seeing displays of both of these, proper pride and humility, in our allies, but also in the, also in the LGBT respondents who recover from healthy or from chronic shame. We're seeing pride as being a really important role, like pulling them back to humility from the vices of deficiency. We have our one paper that's making that argument, so this is what we're 
and I'll just, say, just I think retaining the concept of shame helps to understand the the evil of systematic oppression is that it creates this this yeah. ep, this perpetual chronic shame not just in the case of LGBT oppression but you know if you think about racism if you think about sexism it's these degrading narratives that people are then forced for their whole lives to navigate that w the result of that is shame right and so by actually kind of disaggregating different types of shame and like getting more of a of a purchase on how is it that symbolic power can you know create these harmful dynamics that can actually you know jeopardize people's lives right then you you know can actually kind of um, you know understand better how it is that uh, you know the cultural aspects of oppression work yeah, I wanted to ask you what the hypothesis is that's emerging yeah. from the data well, that this, you did. Well, this ridiculousness up here. So it's, <laughs> <Okay>. the idea, <laughs> it's the idea that, so here's what happened. We, um, in the, or yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in. Oh, no, yeah, it's okay. just, just, I think the, in, in yeah. hypo, 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 hypothetical terms, the hypothesis would be that, that mm -hmm. pride and humility are, are two sides of the same thing, um, both of which are invested in relationship in a particular way, and the, the vices in either direction are actually disruptions, you know, create disruptions in relationships. And that that disposition seems to be what enables healthy shame or, or morally, uh, it, it sets the stage for someone to experience shame as a possible motivation to virtue, at least in our respondents. So, so in the um, LGBT respondents who have been on, is there a little, the, on the oh. vices of deficiency side, what we're finding is that it's, it coming into proper pride that pulls them back toward humility. So we have this one quote from, I think um, it's at the end of our slides, yeah, that one quote, yeah, is that the red dot? Yeah, the red yeah. dot's the point. So our, our, um, our LGBT respondents are, that we're talking about are over here. And when we talk to some of them about resilience and recovery, um, and they talk, about, they talk about this, but it seems to bring them back to this too. So we're seeing that like they're able to, um, this somehow, these two things are somehow happening together in their experiences. And then this one respondent that we were gonna show um, talked about how that pulling back to, um, uh, ver yeah, yeah, here, um, enabled him to have a, a, a better relationship with shame. So he talked about now having over, you know, really worked through chronic shame, claiming and owning his identity as gay, um, in a kind of stance of healthy pride, of confidence and self-worth, enabled him to relate to shame in a much healthier way, and he used that language. So we're, we're curious about that. Um, so. I, I would like to have Will as, as moderator and ask a question myself. Yeah. And, and it's about the, um, the claim that you make about the healthy shame yeah. and the unhealthy shame, uh, or, or you know, I, I would say, I would call it deep shame, I guess unhealthy shame. The dot, the purple dot of shame, yeah. Yeah, the, pur the, the <laughs> purple, yeah, yeah, slash, black, heavy, all the heavy, dark stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it, it could be possible for shame to be healthy or have a healthy component, but I'm not sure that shame, that intrinsic to shame mm -hmm. is that which pulls people out of it. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that you can sort of be stuck in a kind of unhealthy shame, mm -hmm. but what pulls you out of it is some sort of desire to be other. And so I'm thinking in terms of addiction. So mm -hmm. if you think of a, a somebody who says, uh, I'm an addict, I mean, that's the sort of first step toward recovery is admitting that. And certainly there would be a, a sort of shame, it seemed to me, mm -hmm. that would come along with that admission. But then what is it that pulls you out of that toward the statement, I am a recovering mm -hmm. addict or a recovered addict, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that's not connected with shame, mm -hmm. but maybe with a desire to have relationships or to restore relationships, yes. yeah. which is something that I don't immediately see as being intrinsic to shame. Right, so we were asking that very question and, and actually asking it of some of the philosophers. Like, w It doesn't seem like there's anything about shame itself that necessarily lends it to these more constructive outcomes. But then, in, again, this, I think it goes back to the previous question, if shame has this ambivalent character and it really does reflect also this yearning and this longing, then there may be something in that ambivalence. There's that, that, may, that sort of desire for relationship. So we're understanding shame as actually having that component. Um, now, toxic and maybe toxic and deep shame 
maybe your point is it destroys that or something. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's what I don't see yeah. as intrinsic yeah. to shame is yeah. that is that sort of light within within shame that sort of brings you out of it. Yeah. Right. So so I, I have trouble seeing that as being part of shame. Yeah. But but if you think about the difference between like shame and shamelessness, right? Like the wait, maybe I'm just not following, right? Like shame like the like our respondents in a state of like this, you know, profound toxic shame want to be good enough for God, right? And it's yeah, like none of that, none of no, none of the shaming stuff works to to help in any way. It just makes it worse and worse and worse. But it's coming from that place though, right? I mean I think isn't that what what yeah. you're kind of getting I'm at. I'm trying to get at, like, it's coming from that place of desire. Like, I want to be in relationship. I want to be, um, follow you. I love you. I want to be in this connection and relationship with you. And I'm, um, and with other people. You yeah. know, it's not just, you know, God and other people. But it gets terribly distorted and turns into sort of self Which is why then know, humility isn't, you know, like, that's not the first step out of that, right? Because that just perpetuates it. It's, um, you know, uh, Elizabeth Edmond talks about, um, like, what, what straight Christians have to learn, straight cis Christians have to learn from queers is that pride isn't just this, uh, you know, sort of vicious, uh, you know, place of arrogance, but that it's recognition of the worth of others, mm -hmm. right? And then in recognition of the worth of others, there's this, and our um, respondent Emily talked about that, like when, you know, this it seemed to be working fine for me, except, you know, an hour later, she she was the one who, uh, you know, was in, hospitalized with a heart rate of 19, that she hadn't even thought about that in connection with it. But, um, you know, she said, you know, it seemed to be working for me, but then I realized that, you know, hearing from others that this celibate approach was, was harmful to them and hurting them, that was what made me rethink the whole approach. You know, it was her concern and care for others that made her realize, like, maybe there's something wrong with this whole framework that I've adopted. So maybe that's part of it. Any? One la oh, we have a couple. My goodness, I just didn't notice. We have we have Ross, Ryan, and Colin. You're not Colin. You're, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I always well, go with, with your first guess. With thinking of the themes of this uh, of this group being the self, is it possible that part that where the light comes, where the motivation comes out of experience of shame, is the sense of wanting to be one's best self? Mm -hmm. And if that's true, that's part of what makes the sacramental shame you described so debilitating, mm -hmm. because your best self is queer. Mm -hmm. And so you can't strive to be your best self. It's shame, shame can't be motivating in that context. But in other contexts, um, it is the, the desire to be your better self that shame reveals that you're not, but motivates you to become. Yeah, thank you for that. Did you want to comment or I? Um, start, yeah, 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 we're going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but actually it makes me think of um, some of our respondents who um, in one conference I remember just being, frankly, just moved to tears because, and I think it's consistent with what you're saying and it's helpful to think of it in those terms, they came, what did it for them actually was their prayer life, their relationship with God. God was the only person and it was in that moment where they heard God saying to them, um, I love you as who I made you to be, please stop running from that, please love me back. <laughs> and, and it was so, it was that like, that's who I wanna be. And, and they trusted something and enabled them to trust themselves enough to let that voice have authority in their prayer experience. But I think it's consistent with what you're saying, that striving to be. So thank you for that um, frame. Mm -hmm. The question I have is, uh, you, you mentioned that you have 85 something um, individuals, interviewees. So um, my question is, I'm kind of curious about the demographic detail information. That are those are what what are the ethnicity within mm -hmm. the group, or any mm -hmm. pos you know, possible cultural mm -hmm. comparison? Are, are they all Caucasian, or do you throw in any things that either Black American mm -hmm. or African American, Asian? Because I think they may have a different perspective in terms of the shame or that's just my curiosity. Yeah, um, so I, I can't give you the, the numbers, um, which I guess would be helpful, but um, so the movement itself is predominantly white. Interestingly, um, there's kind of a divide in the movement, um, particularly younger organizations. 
are um, very self-consciously working to incorporate an intersectional analysis that understands that like, you know, sexuality means different things in different racial contexts and different gendered contexts. Gen gender means different things, race means different things. Um, and so even many of the white, gay, privileged, cisgender uh, men in, in some of these groups are um, working very consciously to give the stage to people of color, particularly trans people. And so there are voices, like the, there are voices being um, uh, heard that are sort of heard more loudly than the numbers within the, the, these organizations. You know, like the demographic data um, would tell you something about, the, I mean, and, you know, and it's, it's always fraught. Uh, so there are Asian Americans, there are African Americans, um, and we are oversampling uh, people of color, you know, in quotes, you know, not oversampling, but, you know. Um, and, you know, so, you know, uh, maybe 15 African Americans, a couple Asian Americans, not a lot of Latinx. People, I mean, because not a lot of Latinx people are involved in conservative Protestantism in the United States. Um, so it's um, a lot, so there's, there's often talk, people talk about, you know, so Emily um, is uh, Hapa and, um, you know, Asian, mixed, you know, Asian Pacific Islander, white, and talks about how she came to Christianity because she saw it as a, um, as a, a faith based on a message of social justice and then started to realize like, wait a minute, this is, this, like where, what happened to that, you know? Um, and so those, those experiences um, are part of the story for sure, um, but there's always this tension. And the, the justice uh, component actually of the project is very much about the tension um, between, you know, wanting to keep a place open for you know, gay conservatives who voted for Trump and just want to know if they can live another day, you know, is there a place for me in this world? And, you know, at the same time, this, this trajectory um, on a path of justice where people are realizing, like, you know, because I understand what it feels like not to be listened to and to have people who claimed to love me refuse to hear about how they were hurting me, I have to fight racism. And, uh, I have to give the stage to people who are gonna talk specifically about their experiences of racism in predominantly white churches and things like that. Um, but then, you know, when you have that message, that alienates the, you know, the, the person who, you know, who's, who's at the gay Christian conference with their parents who, you know, just wanna be normal. And so they're, you know, they're navigating that tension and that's, that's the place of that kind of racial and ethnic diversity that you're talking about in the movement. So this is something that occurred to me uh, in part because of a conversation that I had uh, at lunch with Will about guilt. Um, and wh I, what I'm wondering is if this is potentially a way to resolve this issue with the, you know, uh, is there something good about shame? And what I'm wondering is maybe the best way to think about this is that what is important uh, is not, uh, in, in terms of what is good, is not shame itself or proneness to shame, but uh, susceptibility to shame or vulnerability yeah, to that's shame, Thomas's right? Because position, if you, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because if you that's are liability. if you are shameless, it's mm -hmm. not so much that's like right. the issue. The problem is not that you never experience shame; that's it's right. that you are invulnerable that's to right. shame, right? That's her position. And so yeah. it is the capacity to experience shame that is what goes along with humility that's and right. what goes along with the positive qualities that you're that you're seeing in it, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the shame itself or the tendency to experience shame. Yeah, thank yeah. you. That's, that's what we're picking up on as well. Um, Thomas and Art makes that argument, but then what our respondents show is that that is even not quite right because the capacity itself, your liability to it varies with where, how you've been um, positioned in social hierarchies that may have stigmatized you. So we're trying to complicate even that piece. But yes, the liability is where the issue is. Thank you.